Hello, everybody, and welcome into the Apples and Genos Fantasy Hockey Podcast. My name is Nate Groot Nibbling. I'm the creator of Apples and Genos and originator of the Zero G Draft Strategy. In this podcast, I'm going to go over the most puzzling players league wide as submitted by the Apples and Genos Discord server. Let's get it. Welcome in, welcome in. We got Blake in here already saying zero G is for me. Yes, it is for you, and it can be for all of you watching and or listening as well. Joel says, what up, Stud Muffin? Me? Huh, man. All right. We're starting off with a bang. Toronto Dave's in here. Hashtag zero G. Good to see you, buddy. <laughs> Blake says, are you looking in the mirror again, Joel? We got some uh, we got some bro love going on in the comments already. You love to see it. You absolutely love to see it. Well, we got a full slate tonight. Lots of players submitted by the Apples and Geos Discord server that are definitely puzzling. Uh, we got to figure out what we're doing with these guys for fantasy purposes. Before we get into that, I am just going to run through some news and notes. We did have some more notes. Seems like Monday is always a fairly big news day in the NHL. We've got Andrei Svechnikov apparently getting an MRI. Uh, yeah, that's not a great sign after he already missed a couple of uh, games to now be getting the MRI. Uh, that kind of indicates to me that things are not getting better and they're trying to figure out what's going on. Uh, so I'm not loving that. Uh, obviously, we don't have any new information just yet, but uh, I can't say that I'm loving the uh, loving that uh, that that uh, little bit of uh, news that we got there so we'll see how it goes but um, yeah it's not great uh -huh, I will say not ideal so we got Kyle Connor also getting an MRI you get an MRI you get an MRI everybody gets an MRI apparently um, but yeah Kyle Connor if you saw the hit uh, it did not look good uh, knee on knee like classic knee on knee nothing else touching just knees colliding and yeah Kyle Connor clearly got the worst of that not a great one um, and yeah I'm gonna be a little bit surprised if there's not at least a week or two missed by Kyle Connor we'll have to obviously have to wait to hear how that one comes through as well but um, yeah it was not a great looking hit and we, I would expect there will be some time missed there in his absence, uh, yeah, it'll be interesting to see, obviously, what we get out of the lines. If the Jets continue to keep Ehlers on the second power play uh, in Kyle Connor's absence in the game, Alex Ayafalo moved up to that top line. So uh, maybe you see a little bit of a boost for Ayafalo. I'm still not that interested in Ayafalo. He's kind of... Uh, we've talked about it, but he's had uh, he's had hot streaks, and then he goes silent for like 30 plus games, and you just wonder where this guy's at, even when he's getting good deployment. So not super interested. Maybe a deeper league stream, I'd be okay with it. But yeah, you can look at Alex. I have follow in your deepest of leagues, I guess. Uh, we've got Jamie Drysdale, Trevor Zegras, Mason McTavish all traveling with the team. That's good news for the Anaheim Ducks. They're going on a road trip to New York. They're playing the Islanders on Wednesday uh, is the first one, then the Rangers Friday and the Devils Sunday. So good to see that they're all on that trip. We don't really know exactly when each one will be returning, but the fact that they're all going is definitely a good sign. Brian Rust is officially week to week now after being day to day for a couple of missed games. Uh, in his place, we've got, uh, I, I even have to double check this because I don't even remember the guy's first name. It starts with a V, I'm pretty confident, but Valtteri Pustinen, yes, is on the top power play in practice as of today, apparently. So we'll see how that goes. Uh, maybe, maybe Valtteri Pustinen was was just what the Pittsburgh power play needed all along. Enough with these superstars. Enough with Sidney Crosby and Eric Carlson and Chris Letang and Evgeny Malkin. What you need is a little Valtteri Pustinen in your life, and that'll get that power play going. Uh, we've got Dylan Larkin out at least a week. It sounds like uh, from the quote that I saw, or the 
a little interview that I saw, it sounds like it still could be definitely leaving the door open that could be significantly longer. And that wouldn't surprise me either. Definitely a scary moment for Dylan Larkin uh, getting knocked out on the ice there. And with his history, you have to imagine they will be pretty careful with him. Uh, the retaliation of that event was David Perron cross-checking a guy in the head, and he got the book thrown at him, suspended for six games. Honestly, I mean, I try not to weigh in on these things, but man, uh, the NHL uh, uh, the player of Department Safety, Department of Player Safety, there we go. Department of Player Safety is just all over the place with these suspensions, like... There's been a lot of other things that they could have thrown the book at. Um, we've seen literally people get cross-checked or slashed in the head, and it's been nothing. Um, think about Truba slashing. Uh, who was it that Truba slashed in the head? And it was nothing. Trent Frederick, I think, right? Um, and I guess this is where they draw the line with this particular one. I don't know. Uh, it doesn't make any sense to me whatsoever what they're doing there. And I don't think it makes a lot of sense to the players either. So uh, that's my take on that uh, fr free unsolicited uh, take on the D DOPS in the NHL. Uh, Alex Tuck could be back as soon as Wednesday. That's good news for the Buffalo Sabres. They could definitely use his services. Deshaun Jersey is still out in the game tonight and still not playing the Coyotes do have a back-to-back -back here to open the week. So he could be back tomorrow, but didn't go tonight. And then Pavel Zaka and Charlie McAvoy are still unclear for the Boston Bruins. Their first game is Wednesday against New Jersey. Um, and so they're still up in the air, apparently. They're hoping to have more information tomorrow. But uh, keep an eye on those two guys if you're rostering them there. All right, we got more comments. We got Toronto Dave saying, Leafs about to give the Islanders a long night. Let's go. Uh, last I checked, let's... Oh, yeah, the... Uh, I don't know about that. The Islanders are up 3-1 in the second here, TD. I don't know. Uh, we may have to... Uh, Put the parade planning on hold for a moment. Blake says, Nate and I are going on a road trip to Vegas for the draft next year. Who's coming? <laughs> All right. That would be awesome. I have to admit that sounds incredible for sure. Chris Hollywood asking, is what Trocheck doing sustainable rest of season? So let's talk about that before we jump in. Get that one out of the way right away. He's got a goal and eight points in his last five games, averaging 22 minutes a night, which is obviously a huge part of this. 59th in shots per 60 and 20th in individual scoring chances, four per 60 over the last five games. On ice stats look pretty good too. 51st in Corsi, four per 60 and 15th in scoring chances, four per 60. On the season, kind of a weird stat line but on pace for 19 goals and 79 points uh yeah the shots are down this season for him which is odd but the scoring chances the individual scoring chances are still there which maybe just means he's been a little bit unlucky in terms of actually hitting the net the on ice stats have been terrific uh obviously the exposure to artemi panarin and what he's been doing so far this season is a big part of that 54 percent ipp 10 percent shooting percentage 13.2 percent on ice shooting percentage on ice shooting percentage could regress uh, a bit here but the ipp could come up and kind of offset that i feel fairly comfortable with trocheck in a 70 plus point range at the least and you know if he stays hot i i can see point per game for trocheck um i do think that most of this is pretty sustainable and i would expect that he gets a few more goals <laughs> especially if he continues to turn it on in terms of the shots so that's my take on trocheck love the player obviously friend of the show Vinny tro so we love to see it when he's doing well and Sony is in here. I hope I'm saying your name right there. New follower. Nice job. Apples and Genos. Thanks for that. Appreciate it. Appreciate all the love in the chat so far. It's great to see. Why don't we get started with some puzzling players. Top of the list, we've got Josh Norris. Josh Norris, if you haven't already heard, is my head-to-head -head streamer deathmatch pick of the week against Blake. So you know he's going to absolutely go off this week. In his last five games, though, just one goal and one assist for two points. Averaging over 19 minutes a night. 15th in the league in shots per 60 in that span. Although just 125th in individual scoring chances for per 60. On ice numbers are pretty solid. 31st in Corsi 4 per 60. 85th in scoring chances 4 per 60. On the season, he's pacing for 
26 goals, 52 points, uh, which feels light. He's got a 60% IPP, 10.7% shooting percentage, and an 8.6% on ice shooting percentage. The on ice shooting percentage for sure, uh, to me, is just something that is bound to come up. Uh, has been a really solid offensive environment there in Ottawa for the past year plus. Uh, ever since really Stutzla took off and they've assembled this kind of cast of characters with Drew and last year it was Dabrinkit, this year it's Tarasenko. Tarasenko's been playing well as of late as well. And I just think that we're looking at a player here who through his first, last year he played eight games, so maybe we throw out that, one, that uh, season, but in his two uh, real full seasons that he's played so far. He's shot 17.7 and 20%. And this year he's shooting 10.7%. Like, I just think Norris has a ton of ceiling beyond this. If he keeps up even the rates that he's at right now and he's skating 19 minutes a night, I think you got 40 goal potential here with Norris. Not saying that that's the expectation, but that's the potential of a guy like Josh Norris. And that's why I'm pretty excited about it. Even if he doesn't hit that goal total, I do think that the on ice shooting percentage comes up to a pretty significant level beyond this um you know not last year the eight game season that was last year but the year before he was up at a 12.5 percent on ice shooting percentage i'm not sure he'll get all the way up there but you can see how big a jump it could be for josh norris to get up and above these numbers like i think that 70 points is not uh out of question as a point pace for the rest of the season from this point onward so I'm pretty interested in Josh Norris at the moment, and I do think he should be rostered in all formats, especially just given the week that is for the Ottawa Senators. If you've got spots open, especially on the Tuesday and Thursday, which are the first two games they play this week, then it makes it a no-brainer because they end the week with a Friday-Sunday, both on off nights, avoiding the super heavy Saturday. So Josh Norris, this is the week to be in, and this is the week to try him out. I do believe he's going to provide some returns this week week we got some more stuff in the chat that we got to get to patrick's in here early returns on my palmieri stream thanks nate hope he keeps it up all week yeah it looks like palmieri is in on two goals so far so he's got a goal and he's got an assist in the early going um yeah i guess glad for your stream but uh not so glad for my maple leaves here uh, Matt says, I offered Zuccarello for Ovi two weeks ago. He declined. Should I send it again? If not, what would be fair value for Ovi? Uh, yeah, I don't mind sending things again. Um, you know your league mate better than I do, obviously. If they would get really angry about something like that, then maybe you don't want to do that. But I have no problem sending offers again. Maybe send it with a message and say, hey, I know we went over this uh, a couple weeks ago, but just checking in to see if your mind has changed at all, just given how the last couple weeks have gone. I think that's a fair thing to say, and it's a fair thing to ask. So I'm definitely not opposed to doing that. Let's keep rolling. We got to talk about Mike Matheson. Two assists in his last five games, which is not great, but he's still averaging over 26 and a half minutes time on ice in this span. 128th in shots per 60, but up at 32nd in individual scoring chances, 4 per 60. On ice numbers are never going to be terrific in Montreal. 125th in Corsi, 4 per 60. 80th in scoring chances, 4 per 60. On this season now, he's pacing for 15 goals, 56 points, averaging 25 minutes a night. I just think this is a, still just a very, very solid defenseman. 59% IPP, 7.6% shooting percentage, 9.3% on ice shooting percentage. Uh, most of that feels pretty sustainable to me. The on-ice shooting percentage could tick up a little bit. The IAPP could tick down a little bit. Uh, usually you don't see defensemen with this really, really high IPP, although... I do say, and I do think it's true in this case, that a guy like Matheson is legitimately one of the best offensive players that Montreal has, and so he will just kind of by default factor into more of the team's offense than you would typically see for a defenseman. So um, the regression might not be as big as you might think from that IPP number. I'm actually curious now what it was last year because I do think that I mean, nothing has really changed in the grand scheme of things uh, from last year. And obviously last year he absolutely went off and we were all wondering, is it really a case where he's taken a step, taking a legitimate step, or is it just uh, a really good season? He had a 54% IPP last year for context uh, across 48 games there. So pretty solid sample size. Is 59% too high? I would say so, but 
If he comes back down only to 54%, then that's really not much of a haircut, and the on-ice shooting percentage could tick up just a little bit and offset that. So I'm not too worried about it, but I would put Matheson, you know, around a 50 to 55-point pace, but he's going to score goals too, which is crucial. He's a shot-producing defenseman, and he's efficient. He's always had a high shooting percentage for a defenseman, and he's continuing that on this year. So overall, I just really think Matheson is about as solid as they come. He's going to continue to do his thing regardless of what's going on around him and I kind of feel exactly the same way I felt about Matheson as I did before the season started. Another comment here in the chat Brady plus Hyman or Rantanen plus Kaprizov in a categories league I'm gonna go ahead and assume that there's bangers in here uh, otherwise I don't think it's much of a, a close conversation than it would be Rantanen and Kaprizov pretty handily without that I still think I'm going Rantanen and Kaprizov unless you really got to have the hits from Brady. Um, yeah, I just expect Rantanen and Kaprizov to outscore those two by, I don't know, 20 or 30 points over the rest of the season. Uh, I just think that in pretty much any setup, as long as you have a few, uh, a few point scoring categories in your league, then that's going to be the most worthwhile thing to add. Hyman is super hot right now. I don't think regardless, you want to be buying high on Hyman if that's what you're looking to do. Um, so I think this is just a case where you go with the guys who are going to score the most points, who are tried and true superstars in the league, and you just take that to the bank and you go and find your hits elsewhere. All right, Mikhail Granlund is next up, and obviously he's uh, he's been doing the thing the last little bit, that's for sure. Granlund has two goals, 11 points in his last five games, 21 and a half minutes average time on ice. This is really crazy, crazy stuff. It's, it's kind of hard to overstate how crazy this is from a player like Mikhail Granlund, uh, but yeah. He's doing the thing, that's for sure. 21 and a half minutes average time on ice, as I said, in this last five games on the season, he's averaging almost 21, so that's not really a departure. 153rd in shots per 60, 124th in individual scoring chances, 4 per 60, 179 in Corsi, 4 per 60, 95 in scoring chances, 4 per 60. On the season, pacing for 12 goals, but 70 points. The on-ice stats, everything, individual stats, on-ice stats, it all looks bad. Much, much worse if you look over the course of the full season. 72% IPP, 7% shooting percentage, 12% on-ice shooting percentage. The 12% on-ice shooting percentage is definitely going to come down. I think the IPP probably comes down as well. I think Grandland is probably like mm, uh, 45, 50, maybe 55 if things continue to go well. Point pace player, um, kind of at his base level. So... That's where I'm at on Granlin. I think he is just a streamer. He's on a really sweet hot streak, and probably at the end of the season, most of us aren't even going to remember that he had this hot streak. Uh, that's my take on Mikhail Granlin. Sorry to be a downer, but uh, that's the way I see it. Let's keep rolling here. Let's talk about Matt Zuccarello, the zucchini man. I can't do it as well as Blake does, but uh, I'll give it a shot. All right, I'll give it a shot. He's got a goal, five points in his last five games, averaging just over 17 minutes a night. And 271st in shots per 60, 253rd in individual scoring chances, four per 60. I mean, that's never really been Zuccarello's game. He's never been a volume shooter by any stretch of the imagination. 83rd in Corsi, four per 60, 60th in scoring chances, four per 60. Obviously, that's a little bit more like it. The interesting thing to note here is that Zuccarello was taken off the Kaprizov line in the last game against the Kraken. Uh, Boldy and Kaprizov and Joel Eriksson Eck were the line there, and they did score a goal. And Zuccarello's line with Marco Rossi scored a goal as well. So I don't really think they're going to have a reason to go away from this for the next game at the very least. Uh, so you have to kind of expect that we're going to see the exact same thing happen here on Thursday, which is the next time that the Wild play. The Wild play only two games this week, Thursday against Calgary and Saturday against Vancouver. I expect that they'll go with the same lineup again Thursday because it worked against the Kraken on Sunday. And that's just not great for Zuccarello. He's definitely dependent on 
his teammates to a much larger extent than a guy like I would assume Matt Boldy or Kirill Kaprizov would be. That being said, I think Zuccarello is a terrific player on pace on the season for 19 goals, 88 points. I don't know if I see him as an 88 point player and you see that in the IPP, 82% IPP, 11.4% on ice shooting percentage. The on-ice shooting percentage, if he keeps exposure to Kaprizov at even strength and on the power play all season long, I could see him sustaining 11.4. It'd be on the high side, but it could happen. The 82% IPP I don't think happens uh, over the course of a full season. And so I think you're looking at a best-case scenario if Zuccarello is plastered, uh, st- stuck at the hip uh, to Kirill Kaprizov for the rest of the season. He could hit a point per game, but that would be a best case scenario in my mind. More likely you're talking about a guy who's going to be around the 70, 75 point mark um, would be still be a pretty solid outcome in my mind. I'm, I wouldn't bank on Zuccarello uh, doing more than a 70 point pace for the rest of the season, I guess is what I would say there. Antonio is in the chat. He says, I have a chance to trade McCann or Marchenko for Patrick Line. What do you think? 12-man points league in third place. Can wait for him to bounce back. Which player would you trade? Uh, I would definitely trade Marchenko of those two. McCann, I mean, he's just got a much longer pedigree of doing things in the league, especially last year he had a big season. And I think he's... Yeah, just a better player at this point in his career. I think Marchenko's deployment is going to go up and down throughout the season. I don't know what Pascal Vincent is doing in Columbus, and I don't like it. And they just lost Boone Jenner, which is going to negatively affect the entire lineup. Uh, Everybody's going to be playing with worse centers and just having the puck on their stick less. And so overall, if you are going to trade someone for Patrick Laine, I would trade Marchenko, who's on the same team, but likely to get less deployment than Laine over the course of the season. I know Laine has not been getting great deployment in the last little bit here, but on the whole, I do expect that Laine will get better deployment than Marchenko rest of season. Uh, I just think that, you know, they're paying this guy a lot of money and they really in the end, do want him to succeed, however much it doesn't look like it. And I do think that things will even out for Line a at some point. And I mean, Line a has not been terrible uh, in the last little bit. He's got four points in his last five games. I think that he's doing just fine. He had four shots in 13 minutes in the game uh, here on, su- on uh, Sunday yesterday. So... All that to say, I think Line A is still a solid player. The underlying metrics are fine, uh, if not spectacular. I do think he takes a bit of a hit with Jenner out, but I do think Line A still has all the talent that he used to have. It didn't vanish overnight, and he's still a valuable player for fantasy purposes over the course of the season. You're going to have to be patient, but over the course of the season, I do think Line A is still valuable. All right, let's keep rolling. Brandon Montour was highly requested. Blake and I talked about Brandon Montour at length on the show yesterday, so go and check out that one on the flagship pod if you haven't heard it already. The long and the short of it is I think Brandon Montour is the biggest buy low in the game right now, and everyone should be sending offers for Brandon Montour. That is my short and sweet take on Montour. You can get more uh, from our chat yesterday, but yeah, I... They, nothing has changed from on tour. If you were wondering whether last season was a mirage, it wasn't. The numbers are all right back there, just the way they were, except for the actual goals and assists. So I have no concerns about Brandon Montour rest of season. Blake asked me to to basically uh, let's let's check the wording. Let's let's go to the tape. Let's get the actual wording from Blake here, uh, because he said, "What? W- who would win in a street fight?" Middle stat or Marcus Johansson. Now, this is referencing the fact that uh, I have voiced my distaste for Casey Middlestat and Marcus Johansson on various occasions. I mean, look at their stats. Neither are terrific. Middlestat, despite almost 23 minutes a night, only has a couple of goals in his last five games. No assists. Underlying stats are atrocious for both of these players. Uh, I did go de- uh, digging a little bit deeper to see who I thought would actually win in a street fight. You're talking about a couple of true bangers, true beefers here, really, Blake. Uh, you got Marcus Johansson, who has eight penalty minutes on the season, and middle stat all the way up at 14. So he's in the lead there. Neither of these players has a major or a misconduct. That could have been an easy way to sway my verdict here. Don't have any uh, way to do it there. Johansson has thrown 16 hits to middle stat six, uh, which is obviously a big uh 
a big uh, uh, point in his favor as well. So overall, I think I have to go Johansson in the street fight here. Um, it seems like Middlestad might not even try to hit him back if he hit him, uh, just based on the number of hits that Middlestad's uh, thrown this season. So, yeah, it might just be a really one-sided thing where Marcus Johansson hits him a few times, says sorry in a very polite voice, and Casey Middlestad falls over and falls down. All right, that aside, let's keep rolling. We got to talk about Johnny Goudreau. And Patrick Laine, both were requested. So I talked a little bit about Laine, obviously, already said my piece there. I think Laine is a plenty talented player. I think he'll get back into some deployment at some point, whether that's because Pascal Vincent has been fired or not is yet to be seen. But uh, one way or the other, I do expect that line A's deployment will come up at some point here. Like they're just going to be forced to play him more, especially with Jenner out. Uh, maybe they're going to do the whole playing line A at center thing. That would actually be a mistake in my eyes. I don't think line A is a center. I don't know why you would want to turn him into a center that does not make any sense to me whatsoever but uh i digress uh but if he is gonna play on this line with johnny goodrow again that's obviously a good situation for both of them they are the most two single talented players on the team um you could argue adam fantilli and i would hear that argument but uh at the moment, uh, these two are guys who have a pedigree in the NHL, even if they aren't living up to it right now. So I do like to see those two together. And then obviously, you want to see those two on the power play together. Again, Pascal Vincent splitting up the power play, lining Goudreau on different units. It, make it make sense, please. Somebody make it make sense what Pascal Vincent thinks he's doing here. He's just overcoaching the hell out of this team right now and it is not a team that needs overcoaching anyway johnny goudreau one goal two points in his last five games 17 minutes average time on ice the underlying stats are atrocious here 274th in shots per 60 224th in individual scoring chances four per 60 114th in Corsi four per 60 68th in scoring chances four per 60 pacing for 11 goals and 41 points on the season is Johnny Goudreau. So I'm of a couple of minds here. First off, that that production is atrocious. Goudreau doesn't hit. He doesn't do anything else. If he's not shooting, if he's not scoring, he's not doing anything for you in your lineup. He is a black hole. And so I really don't want to be hanging on to black holes in my lineup um, as just waiting for them to go off because they should go off. At the same time, you're talking about Johnny Goudreau. This guy has had tremendous seasons in the NHL. And you have to think, with it, they have enough talent like Marchenko. You've heard my love for Marchenko on this podcast before. Fantilli, you've heard me talk about him and how much I think of his talent. That he's going to be a star in this league, uh, if not this season, then probably next. Then you've got Zach Wierenski on the back end, who I have a ton of love for. So it's just really baffling uh, what Johnny Gaudreau has put on on record on the season. And it's not like we're uh, <laughs> a very few games into the season at this point, 30 games into the season, and he's still down here 322nd in individual scoring chances, 4 per 60 on the season. It is just all signs of bad for Johnny Gaudreau. I'm trying to wait it out with Johnny Gaudreau. I will say that I am desperately trying to wait it out because I know that as soon as I drop him, somebody else is going to pick him up and he's going to go off on their team. Uh, but it's it's right on the line at this point, basically. If someone tells me, man, I got to drop, I got to drop Johnny Gaudreau. You know, I'm so far behind in games played. I need to pick up somebody who gets me a bunch of games played this week. I need to pick up Josh Norris, who's going to give me four games played to Johnny Gaudreau's two this week. And that's really going to make a difference uh, in my ability to win this matchup this week. And, you know, I'm, I'm three and six or something because I drafted Johnny Gaudreau. Um, yeah, I can't fault you for doing that move. I can't. I really can't at this point. I don't want to be making that move. I don't know that that's the optimal move. I'm trying to hang on to Johnny Gaudreau. But if I have to, if there's a clear-cut benefit for a specific matchup, for a specific player who's been dropped, um, you know, then these are situations in which I do think that it's worthwhile going out and paying, paying up to get that player. All right, so we've talked about Goudreau. We talked about Line 8. Let's leave the Columbus talk behind for the moment. Timo Meyer was next up. This is, again, a player that Blake and I talked about in the podcast yesterday, so you can go back and check that out. Um, yeah, I'm 
kind of feeling like has proven right a little bit with Timo Meyer that he was not just going to be handed a whole bunch of deployment. It He's definitely underperforming his metrics. Those numbers will bounce back on the season pacing for 48 points. I'm very comfortably saying that he's going to outperform that for the rest of the season. Uh, he's going to start scoring more goals. I'd be shocked to see him not score at like a 35 goal pace for the rest of the season. So he's definitely going to do that. Uh, in my eyes, 21st in the league in individual scoring chances, 4 per 60 on the season. That part's still there for sure. But the potential that he's going to just be moved up and down the lineup, off the top power play, off the Hughes line, off the Heischer line as well, those are scary things uh, for any player, really. We've seen Meyer be able to do it in San Jose without uh, a lot of people around him, but any player is going to feel the effects of that. And in San Jose, he was getting a ridiculous amount of deployment that he's never going to get in New Jersey if he's not attached to Hughes, if he's not attached to Heischer. So definitely more concerned with Meyer. And this is exactly the reason that I was not super into Meyer at cost this uh, in the drafts this year. Ian's in the chat. He says, seeing that the Penguins are going to hold on to their coaching staff for some reason, would you try to move EK65, thinking of offering him four Montour in a bangers league? If you had said almost any other defenseman, I would have said no, because you're saying Montour, it's a conversation. Uh, we talked about Carlson, Blake, and I on the podcast yesterday as well, so you can go back and check that out. Uh, I feel like I'm repeating myself a little bit there, but... I think that Carlson is a 70-point defenseman. I mean, he's pacing for 60 points right now, and he's underperforming in my eyes, uh, some of his metrics. His on-ice stats are insane. The Penguins have been very unlucky. Um, You can blame that on systems, but at some point, the players have just got to convert. Gripping sticks too tight. You know, we see this every year with some teams. They'll go through a cold stretch, and then suddenly the floodgates will open, and everyone will wonder why we ever doubted them. Uh, we saw it already this year with Edmonton. Uh, I think it's a similar situation, honestly, in Pittsburgh right now. I don't think that we need to be completely terrified of what's going on there the way that so many are. So I've got a lot of love for Carlson. I think that he's going to be a 70 point defenseman on the season, if not more. I think he's got upside to 80 points, even point per game potential um montour i think has again 70 point potential obviously more bangers uh from montour than there is for ek65 uh if it's bangers cats um i might go montour i might take montour there but it does feel like a bit of a wash i'm not gonna lie and it feels like selling low on eric carlson and that's the part that i'm not excited about Uh, i think i would be trying to hang on to carlson until he goes on a heater which i do think he's gonna do and most likely in the next month here and you can ride the heater and then potentially collect an even bigger return after that Okay, Gabriel Velarde, one goal, two points in his last five games, averaging just under 15 and a half minutes per game. Uh, Velarde's underlying stats are not great. 205th in shots per 60, 99th in individual scoring chances, 4 per 60. That looks okay, but the on-ice numbers are atrocious. 274th in Corsi, 4 per 60, 236th in scoring chances, 4 per 60. That's not ideal from a guy like Gabe Velarde. Obviously, with the Connor injury and the potential of him being out for a while, we'll see where that lands and how that affects Velarde. But he was already on top power play. Really, the only thing you'd be looking for is if he uh, takes that spot that I follow took that I talked about on the top line alongside Ehlers and Shifley. If he does do that, then that's a lot more interesting. But while he's getting 15-ish minutes a night, I'm just not that interested in Velarde. I don't think that the Winnipeg power play is just so dynamic that you got to have anybody who's touching it. Um, yeah, overall, on the season, like on the season, he's pacing for 10 goals, 31 points. And he definitely deserves better than that. He's only got a 30% IPP. You can see that get a lot better. Um, but the on ice shooting percentage is pretty high at 12.4%. So that's going to come down and kind of meet in the middle. I think this is probably like a 50 to 55 point player at the end of the season. Um, something like that as a point pace rest of season. And that's going to depend, obviously, a lot on where he's being deployed. I don't think Filardi is a player that uh, drives play on his own, really. He definitely needs the exposure to Shifley, to Ehlers, to Morrissey, to Kyle Connor, uh, who's not, obviously, in the lineup anymore. So um, that's what I'm looking for with Filardi. I'm looking to roster him when he's got the great deployment, and then 
when he doesn't, when he's only got power play one or he's only got line one, then he's nothing more than a streamer to me. Andre Kuzmenko has just one goal in his last five games. His struggles have been well documented at this point. Bench Kuzi is what we're calling this guy now instead of Big Kuzi. Interestingly enough, 17th in individual scoring chances, 4 per 60, but under 14 minutes a night, uh, which obviously helps uh, every individual scoring chance. 4 matters a lot more when you're only skating 13-something uh, a night. So that part is not exciting for Andre Kuzmenko and it's really hard to be rostering a guy who doesn't hit doesn't shoot doesn't do a whole lot of anything if he's not putting pucks in the net he is still on the top power play as of this moment uh, but playing at even strength with Nils Aman and Philip Giuseppe, that's not a great spot it's really not and it's hard to be truly excited about Kuzmenko's prospects, especially now given the fact that you've seen that Tockett uh, is not a huge fan and will bench him uh, whenever he feels like he's not putting out what uh, whatever he's looking for. So uh, I'm pretty much all the way out on Kuzmenko. I think he should be dropped. And um, unless he's getting back up with Pedersen or with Miller and Besser, um, unless he's in those spots and on the top power play, I'm just kind of out on Kuzmenko and even if he does get there I would roster him if they had a good week but I'm not like going out of my way to drop everything and add Andre Kuzmenko uh, for the rest of the season here next up Jake Sanderson one goal one assist two points in his last five games skating over 23 minutes a night Sanderson is one of those guys who always passes the eye test. He flies around the ice, terrific skater. And so people uh, love to assume that a player like that is going to just crush for fantasy. Uh, that's not always the case. It just doesn't always work out like that. You have to do more than just skate. Underlying stats are solid for Sanderson. 30th in shots per 60, 81st in individual scoring chances, 4 per 60. On ice numbers, 36th in Corsi, 4 per 60, 47th in scoring chances, 4 per 60. On the season, he's pacing for 19 goals 52 points he's manning the top power play with shabbat out due to injury on the season this is a 44 percent ipp 10.7 percent on ice shooting percentage i think both of those are probably fairly sustainable especially if he's continuing to get power play um, if and when he is bumped off the top power play his point pace probably comes down um you know five to ten points somewhere in that range so you're looking then at more of like a yeah, I, I, if I'm just going by the numbers I said, then you're looking at more of like a 42 to 47 point pace uh, for Sanderson. And the goals are definitely going to come down. He's shooting 11.1%. That's not going to keep up. So I think that Sanderson is a guy that you can roster when he's on top power play. When he's not, it's just a little bit harder to keep him on. Obviously should be rostered for this week with Ottawa having a great schedule this week and with him being on top power play currently. But if he gets off the top power play, if he gets moved around, then that's when I'm going to be out on Jake Sanderson again. Nikolai Ehlers next up. We've obviously talked a little bit about Winnipeg here in the early going, but Ehlers has a goal and five points in his last five games here, averaging 18 and a half minutes time on ice. This is exactly what we wanted for Ehlers, except he's still not getting top power play. We'll see what Winnipeg unfurls as their top power play with Connor out. Ehlers and Connor do both shoot left for whatever that's worth. It would make some sense if he were to take his spot there, but what do I know? Underlying stats are not great for Ehlers the last little bit here. 156th in shots per 60, 297th in individual scoring chances, 4 per 60. 121 in Corsi, 4 per 60, 87th in scoring chances, 4 per 60. On the season, still pacing for only 50 points, but obviously it's only been this last stretch here where he's really gotten back on the top line and started to get a bunch of minutes again. Uh, this is a player, I've said it, uh, many, many times in the offseason. I just want to be kind of in on Ehlers because I do think when it all comes together, it's going to be glorious. He's going to score point per game plus when everything's going his way. The problem here is that even if he does get on power play one, now they've lost Kyle Connor, who is arguably the worst player to lose off of that power play in terms of its efficacy. So, uh, yeah. 
it's not an ideal spot for Ehlers, even if he does get on power play one. That being said, obviously he should be rostered um, at the moment. Any player who's got five points in the last five games, 18 and a half average time on ice, and has a track record like Ehlers does, I definitely want to be in on that player. Uh, but I'm watching Ehlers like a hawk, uh, not... Not trusting Rick Bonus and the Winnipeg coaching staff very much uh, to make a rational decision on what Ehlers' ice time and deployment should be. So still watching, um, willing to roster Ehlers as long as he's on top line and hopefully on top power play here now for a bit. But yeah, still very much watching and watching every single day that Ehlers is on the ice. Next up, we had a question about Ilya Samsona versus Martin Jones, how that's going to look. Uh, obviously, the early going in this game here, uh, like Samsonov had a shutout against Nashville on Monday, or uh, Saturday rather. Uh, here on Monday, he's got three goals against after two periods uh, so far. I saw the first two goals, uh, watched the replays on those. Neither of those, I would say, are necessarily his fault. It would be nice to see a save on one of them, but it's hard to fault a uh, goaltender for either of those plays. I haven't seen the Paul Mary goal yet, so reserve judgment on that. But Sam Sonoff, like Martin Jones, is not an NHL goaltender. There's a reason that nobody picked him up when he was on waivers, and they let the Leafs just send him to the AHL and bring him back up, and nobody wants Martin Jones. There's a reason for that. Martin Jones is not an NHL caliber goaltender, in my opinion. So Sam Sonoff is definitely going to get a lot of run in my opinion. Joseph Wall just got a whole bunch of run uh, when he was hot. Sheldon Keefe appears to just be completely willing to ride the hot hand, and I have to imagine that Samsonov, however bad he might look in one game, is still going to be much hotter overall than Martin Jones. So that's what I would say there. Samsonov is an absolute must roster while Wool is out. Matthew Barzal coming up here. Missed a game, so we've only got the four games here, but he has three goals and nine points in those four games, averaging just over 19 and a half minutes time on ice in that span. 126th in shots per 60, 110th in individual scoring chances, four per 60. Yeah, Matthew Barzal definitely doing the thing. You love to see it. 50th in Corsi, four per 60, 31st in scoring chances, four per 60 in this last stretch here. I think that Barzell, what he's doing right now is a 29-goal pace, 92-point pace for the season, and 74% IPP. He's sustained higher than that before. 11.1% shooting percentage seems pretty reasonable. 11.6% on ice shooting percentage. Maybe a touch higher than you're expecting from a guy on the Islanders, but also not something I would turn my nose up at. So all told, I think that Barzell's got a really good shot at a point-per-game season here and has upside for this 90 points uh, as a pace. Um, if I had to lay an over-under, it would be more around that point-per-game pace for the rest of the season. And obviously Barzal, a guy who sets up more than he shoots, and scores so he's definitely more assist heavy so take that for what it's worth whatever that valuation comes out to in your league with your settings uh, he's definitely more that way but he is shooting a lot more this season than he has in seasons past and that's pretty exciting because that is really what drives um, his points to the next level here and that's what's got me the most excited about Barzal so far Miro Heiskinen has three assists in his last five games, skating over 24 minutes a night, 42nd in shots per 60, 90th in individual scoring chances, 4 per 60, 28th in Corsi, 4 per 60, 65th in scoring chances, 4 per 60. On the season, pacing for just three goals, 50 points. Talked about Heiskinen not that long ago. I think that on the season, you see a 43% IPP, 10.1% on ice shooting percentage. Both of those numbers could tick up a little bit. Wouldn't surprise me to see him back at a, like a 60-point pace. But I also don't know that Heiskanen is a locked and loaded 70-ish point defenseman every single season the way that many thought. Um, he's not really ever been a massive shot contributor, which is usually how you get to those high-end, those upper echelon defenseman seasons, is you got to be pushing, you got to be definitely double-digit goals and in a lot of cases pushing. 20 goals um, in that 15 range at least to get to those high point totals overall and I don't think Heiskanen really profiles as that so when he gets a little bit of bad assist variance like we're seeing so far this season that can really hold down his point totals um, I'm not concerned about Heiskanen but I also didn't value him as highly as a lot of people did coming into this season so 
my evaluation of Heisken has really not changed, but I can understand that a lot of people are a little bit miff because they're expecting 70 plus point Heisken in and they're getting 50 point Heisken in right now. I think it'll settle somewhere in the middle. Fantoma wanted me to talk about Jordan Spence. Uh, I believe he called him the heir apparent or something along those lines to Drew Doughty. Uh, he has zero points in his last five games, and he's averaging under 15 minutes a night, 32nd in shots per 60, 44th in Corsi, 4 per 60. I mean, okay, um, that's not atrocious, I guess, uh, but it's pretty hard to get <laughs> excited about Jordan Spence. I mean, he's on the second power play unit, and when you're skating very few minutes, it's any power play time really does tend to drive up your underlying stats. So you got to kind of weigh those things independently a little bit. Um, yeah, I think Spence is a plenty talented player. Maybe at some point he will get enough cachet with the coaching staff to move further up, get more minutes, and then he'll be interested. But we're a long ways away from that at this point with him skating under 15 minutes a night. Last one here, Yegor Sharangovich has one goal, three points in his last five games, but averaging almost 20 minutes a night, which is something you did not expect to see next to Sharangovich's name. And it's an interesting spot for sure. Um, I think the most interesting thing is if he's continuing to get top power play time, which is something that we've seen a little bit of for Sharangovich in the last little bit. We've seen a Huberto, Kadri, Lindholm, Sharon, Govich, Hannafin top power play for a fair bit here in the last few games for the Flames. If he continues to get that, then obviously there's a floor there that comes with just all that power play exposure. But I will say Sharon Govich's underlying numbers are quite terrible. 278th in shots per 60, 178th in individual scoring chances for per 60 over the last five games on the season, 210th in shots per 60, 277th in individual scoring chances for per 60. That's not much better. He's doing that. He's doing an, he's on an 18 goal, 40 point pace. With a 65% IPP, 12% shooting percentage, 9.8% on ice shooting percentage. None of that screams uh, positive or negative regression to me. I think he's a streamer level player when he's getting this kind of high-end deployment, this almost 20 minutes a night. Sure, I'll roster him then. But he's nothing more than a streamer to me. And as soon as the deployment goes away or he starts to get cold, then I'm kicking Sharon Govich back to the curb. All right, we got through the full list. Thanks to everybody who joined in for the live stream here. Join the chat while you're here. If you could throw a like on the live stream, that really does help us out. If you've not yet subscribed to the YouTube channel, even if you're just listening to this on the podcast, head over to the Apples and Genius YouTube, click subscribe. We're trying to hit 1,000 subscribers by the end of the season. We're well on our way, over 600 at this point, but we're trying to get to that 1,000 mark. If you can help us out and head over to the Apples and Genius YouTube and click subscribe, we would really appreciate that. All that to say, this has been a lot of fun. Uh, I truly look forward to these times when I get to be on the mic and just take questions, take comments, talk to you all, have a good chat. But that's all I've got for this episode. Hopefully it brought you some value, helped you get a little bit better at fantasy hockey today. All the advanced stats you heard today came from Natural Statric, which is a terrific free resource. Many thanks to the band there there for supplying the music for the podcast. Be sure to check out their Spotify as well. That's it, folks. Much love. <laughs>